Welcome, everyone. As we continue our study in the book of Judges, our study tonight will begin with the 19th chapter. Judges has 21 chapters. The first 16 of these chapters were introduced to 13 of the 15 judges recorded for us in the Bible. And as we go into chapters and went into chapter 17 and 18, we saw the terrible spiritual conditions of the people being displayed uh, in those two chapters. But even those two chapters will pale when we see how grotesque are the events that are recorded for us in chapters 19, 20, and 21. I want us to keep in mind, folks, as we study these chapters, we will see here an illustration and demonstration of how morally depraved these people had become in many instances. Now, we are not to think that everybody in Israel was as degraded as we read in these chapters. As I've tried to bring out time or two in our study, even in these dark, dismal, damnable days of, of uh, Israel, there were some who were striving to follow the will of the Lord. They may not have been as perfect in what they practiced, but they at least had a semblance of sincerity, some respect for his authority. But that was not true for the majority of the nation. And that was not true of these various tribes over which these judges uh, exercised their rule and their authority. And what we're going to be reading about tonight, it, it, it is absolutely deplorable. It is beyond one's reasonable imagination that some of the things that are spoken of here could have actually taken place among humanity. Certainly not among people that had any respect for their fellow man or for human life or for authority, or for the will of God. Now we learned back over there in the 17th chapter, the 6th verse, did we not? There was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right according to in his own eyes. A do your own thing generation. And when you have people of that disposition, you have conduct like we're going to study here tonight. And that verse 17, 6 is repeated at the close of this book. They're almost like a parenthesis. And what is in between are these horrendous, horrible events that characterize so many of the people of Israel in these dark and gloomy times. Now, it begins with something that we've read before. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. I think that is to introduce to us the fact there wasn't a centralized authority. There wasn't anybody that had full power to compel and force people to do as they ought or prevent them from doing as they ought not or to execute punishment against those who deserved punishment. But there just didn't exist any authority like that. Everybody just went about his own business and whatever he saw fit. If he didn't like you, too bad. If you didn't like him, tough on him. And that sort of behavior was so contrary to what God's will through the law of Moses had taught these people. And that's something I want us to keep in mind. Not only that not everybody was like that, most people were like that, 
but all of them were subject to the law of Moses. And we see how far removed they had gotten from the law of Moses. And chapter 17 and 18, we saw robbery. We saw idolatry. We saw a disregard for the law of God concerning priests. And on and on it went. But now in chapter 19, we read that there was a certain Levite sojourning in the Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now this is somewhat like we read in chapter 17 about a Levite who had come out of that territory, but this is a different Levite. This is not the same man. This is not the continuing story of 17 and 18. 19 through 21 is an episode by itself and needs to be studied in that light. Now this man had his concubine and the concubine played the whore against him, unfaithful to him. Well, what did he expect from a concubine? Anyway, that's, that's what she did. And they went away, she went away from him and she went back to her father's house. And she was there four months. Well, verse 3 calls him her husband, and he went after her. And it says to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again. Evidently, he was wanting her to be back with him. And I think it's rather amusing that when the father saw the damsel, uh, 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 the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. <laughs> the father of this woman was glad to see him come. I imagine he was saying, I'm, I hope you come get this woman. <laughs> I don't want to. But, but for some reason or another, here we are told, folks, what happened, but we're not told why it happened. So we'll just simply focus upon what happened? The man stayed with the father-in-law three days. On the fourth day, he got up early to leave. And the damsel's father said, stay a little while longer. Comfort yourself. We've got plenty here. You just stay here another day. So he did. I don't know why he wanted him to stay. I don't know why he wanted to stay or consented to stay. As I said, we don't know why, we only know what. But on the fifth day, he got up ready to go again. And the father tried to persuade him not to go. He said, you can go tomorrow. Just kept trying to put off his departure. But this time, verse 10, the man would not tarry that night. He was not going to stay any longer. And so in verse 11, he left and he said, Come, I pray thee, as they were traveling along, let us turn in unto this city of Jebusites and lodge in it. Now they were traveling and they came to this city of the Jebusites. The city of the Jebusites was the city of Jerusalem. And you may recall back in the book of Joshua, when they came into the land, they came up against the city of Jerusalem. They conquered the city of Jerusalem. But either they were beaten back out of it or they just simply withdrew from it and Jebusites now occupied the city of Jerusalem. You know, the city of Jerusalem has always been the center city for Israel. And it didn't become that until many years after this. After Eli and Samuel and Saul, it wasn't until the time of David that he conquered the city of Jerusalem and he made it 
the capital city for the nation. But this man was traveling along and it was suggested, well, let's just turn in here and we're lodged tonight with the Jebusites. But in verse 12, he said, we will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger. So evidently these people that occupied the city of Jerusalem, this man did not look upon them with great favor. He didn't think they would be friendly to him says, this is not of the children of Israel. And so he says in verse 12, we will pass over to Gibeah. Now, verse 14 tells us that Gibeah was in the territory that was uh, assigned to the tribe of Benjamin. Gibeah wasn't very far from Jerusalem. But the man didn't want to stay in Jerusalem he felt he would have better accommodations if he went on to Gibeah. And so they go to lodge in Gibeah. And here we see, and have to recall, a custom among the Jews. They didn't have a Cano Lodge. They didn't have Holiday Inn. They didn't have motels. They didn't have a place to turn in for the night but they exercised hospitality that if a stranger came, why, they would accommodate him, take him even into their own home. But now they came into Gibeah, and no man took them unto his house to lodging, verse 15. And they were out there on the street, nighttime coming. Well, verse 16, we're introduced, it says, to an old man. He comes in from his work out of the field. And he saw them, the wayfaring man, in the street of the city. He said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? Where'd you come from? Where are you going? Why are you out here in the street? You don't have any accommodations at all? And so it was explained to him that they were passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of the Mount Ephraim. And he said, I'm now going to the house of the Lord. Well, the old man, he exercised this custom of hospitality. He invited the man in. He said, we've got plenty for you and for your animals and everything. And you don't just, in verse 20, he says, Peace be with thee, however, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house. Now this Levite and his concubine, and he has a servant along with him. Now they find lodging with this old man in the city of Gibeah. Now here the story becomes typically horrible. It reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were certain men in that city called sons of Belial, that is, the children of the devil. And they said, Bring forth the man that came in in thine house, that we may know him. Now, they wanted to bring this man out and practice their folly of homosexuality. Remember, this is what the people of Sodom proposed to do with the messengers that had come to warn Lot of the coming destruction of the city of Sodom. That shows how wicked they were. Their behavior, it is called folly in verse 23. It's called vile in verse 24. And folks, it is still folly. It is still vile in the way of God. And our society, it seems, wants to accept it as a different lifestyle. Oh, it is a different thing, and it is a lifestyle, and it's right straight from the devil. And the servants of the devil are those that practice it. And it doesn't make any difference what a person's inclinations might be. The law of God still prevails. This practice 
is sinful. And this old man, he said, Nay, my brethren. And he said, Seeing this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. And then he proposes something that is just absolutely unexplainable in my vocabulary. He said, Here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. What is he offering to these heathen, immoral, degenerate savages? These two women. He was just willing to turn these two women right over to them. How, how, how could he do this? How could he turn his own daughter in, over to them? How could he propose to turn this man's concubine over to them? Verse 25 says, the men would not hearken to him. So the man took, so this man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And notice what this poor woman endured. They knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Can you imagine in your mind the horror the terror that woman suffered at the hands of these wicked, wicked people. Now, I don't know what happened to this old man's daughter, but the concubine was turned out, and this, I think, is going to bear keeping in mind. The concubine was turned out by that man. He gave her to them. And that's going to play a part in events that take place before this episode is over. And so the whole night passed. And then came the woman. She fell down at the door, verse 26. Now notice the uncaring spirit of this man, verse 27. The Lord rose up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, went out to go his way. Behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house. Her hands were upon the threshold. What does he say? Up, let us be going. Of all things. Of all things. And she didn't answer. Well, the reason she didn't answer, she had died right there. And this shows how uncaring he was. And then notice what all comes next. Verse 29, he takes a knife. He divided her into 12 pieces. And he sent those 12 pieces of her body throughout all the coast of Israel. Now this was designed to arouse the anger of the people of the nation. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. As wicked as they were, it seems like this was the depth of degeneracy. Even the people of Israel were shocked over what was taking place when this man cut up that woman and sent her parts to his fellow countrymen. Aren't you glad you don't live in a society like that? Let me tell you something, folks. If we can believe, believe anything that the stupid media tells you, and I don't really, but but I am inclined to believe this. There are societies that are practice that sort of thing now. We read about this in Somalia. Things like this are happening in Syria. This is not an uncommon practice. It happened not long ago in Kenya. We know that these people were heathenistic savages. What do we think about people living in my day, in your day? 
I'll tell you, this is a wicked world in so many places. Now, the people of Israel, in verse 20, they were shocked by this, it seems. They gathered together as one man from Dan to Beersheba. I know you call it Beersheba, but it's Beersheba. And Dan was on the south, and this worship of Beersheba was on the north, and from all the land they gathered together at Mizpah. This was a gathering place, sort of a natural amphitheater where a big assembly could come. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, the chief of these people, they came. They didn't have a king, but it seems each one group had their own leaders. And the children of Benjamin heard that they'd come up. And then they went to the people of Benjamin. And they said, uh, then said the children of Israel, tell us how, this is what they said to the man, to the Levite, to the one that turned the concubine over to them. Notice what they said to him. Tell us how was this wickedness? What's all this, what's this all about? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered, I came to Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. So far, he's telling the truth. But notice how he jumps about. And the men of Gibeah rose against me. Well, that was true too. And beset the house round about me by night. That was true too and thought to have slain me. That was true too. And my concubine they have forced that she is dead. That was true too. Oh, I just overlooked telling you that I gave her to them. He didn't tell that. That wouldn't have suited his agenda. He left out any accountability or responsibility on his part for what had taken place. Can you imagine a person like that? Why, sure. He was dodging his own responsibility, his own accomplishment in this. Now, he said they took her. They've committed lewdness and folly. And verse 8 says that all the people arose as one man and said, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will any of us turn to his house. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. Now we've got this little tribe of Benjamin being attacked by all the rest of Israel. But things don't go exactly like these Israelites thought it was going to go. But they went out after Benjamin. The verse 11 says, The men of Israel gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And they asked the tribe of Benjamin, What wickedness is this that is done among you? And they said, Deliver us the men, the children of Belial, who put them to death. But you know the people of Benjamin would not turn those men over to the rest of Israel? They either condoned what they did, ignored what they did, but certainly protected the men that had done this evil, and they would not hearken to the voice of their brethren. So the children of Benjamin gathered themselves out of the cities to go to battle. Here again we see, as we saw in the time of Jephthah, the Israelites involved in fighting other Israelites. A civil war. Don't you know God's heart was grieved over what's taking place among the Israelites at this time? But they go to war. Now it tells us that in Benjamin there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. So they, these left-handed fellows were sharpshooters. <laughs> they, they were good at what they were doing. 
And the children of Israel rose up. They went up to the house of God. They asked counsel of God. It says, which one shall, shall go up first? The Lord said, Judah go up first. Judah was a prominent tribe. Judah was the next door neighbor of Benjamin. Let him go up. So they went up. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. Uh, uh, and the ben, uh, against Benjamin and to fight against them at Gibeah. Verse 21 says, The children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground the Israelites. These Benjamites were not pushovers, were they? So they figured out, well, what are we going to do? Shall we go up against them again? And the Lord said, go up again. They went up again. They got beat back again. And by this time, they were getting a little discouraged. They wept and they fasted. They offered burnt offerings. And then they asked again in verse 27, the children of Israel inquired, shall we go up? The Lord says, yes, go up. I'll deliver them into your hand tomorrow. So they sort of tricked the people of Benjamin in the city of Gibeah. They went up and this tactic had been used by Joshua in taking the city of Ai. They went up to Gibeah, and then they retreated like they were going to get beaten as they had been defeated two times before. But when the men of Gibeah came out, they had men ambushed on either side, came on them and attacked them, destroyed them, burned their city, and the city fell. And then they all decided that they would not give their daughters to the tribe of Benjamin. Look at verse 1 in chapter 21. There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. Now they'd slain most of the inhabitants of Gibeah. It looked like the tribe of Benjamin was going to be extinguished. And they said, let it be. And we will not give our daughters to them so they can perpetuate their tribe. But you know, they began to change back, change on that. They got to thinking about that in verse 3 of chapter 21. O oh Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? They backtracked on what they had decided to do. They were going to wipe Benjamin off the map. But they decided we don't, we don't really want to drive out this tribe completely. And so what they devised was just absolutely something terrible. In verse 6, it says, The children of Israel repented for them, for Benjamin, their brother, and said, There is one tribe cut off from Israel this day. And they began to be sympathetic with the Benjamites, who looked like were on the verge of extinction. Well, there were some people in a place called Jabesh Gilead, and they attacked that place of Jabeth Gilead and they captured 400 young virgins out of Jabesh Gilead. And they decided, we'll give these to the Benjamites. Now they said, we're not going to give our daughters. And they didn't, but they got some other women that they'd turn over to the Benjamites. And I want you to notice how, how they selected and got these women to the Benjamites. They said, they'd already decided, verse 18, Cursed be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. But in verse 19, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh year, yearly. There's going to be a big celebration. And they brought these women there. And they said to the Benjamites, You go and lie in wait in the vineyards. 
And when these women come out and do their dancing, why, let every man rise up and get one of them for himself. And that's the way a man got his wife. I prefer courting myself. <laughs> but this, 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 can, can, can you see how deplorable these people were? I know they don't live by Christian standards. We realize that. And they didn't even live by the Mosaic standards. But they didn't have any respect for one another or respect for God's laws or for family or anything else. And so they did. They came out and they grabbed these women, took these women according to their number of them that danced. And verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It's my judgment that these chapters 17 through 21, they're a part of the period of the judges. I don't know, as we mentioned last time, whether they came in the early part or the latter part. That's not the important thing. The important thing is how deplorable their behavior was, which showed the character of this particular period in Israelite history. You study the judges, you've got some heroes like Gideon and Jephthah, Deborah, later on Samuel. And I commend to you the reading of 1 Samuel. Read about Eli and Samuel. You know, it's a very unique thing about Samuel. They decided at the end of Sam, uh, Samuel's life that they wanted a king, God had Samuel to anoint Saul, and God also later on, because Saul was such a disappointment, had Samuel to anoint David. And so Samuel anointed the first two kings of Israel, and when he died, those two kings were at odds against one another. Saul was trying to kill David. But this, these chapters, these last five chapters of this book, that tells us the story of how things were. And they were pretty bad, weren't they? Anyone have any comment that we'd like to contribute now concerning the book of Judges? We're not going to conclude our study on a sour note with just all bad things. We're going to conclude our study and we'll postpone it to next week on a good note, on a happy time to show the good people, show that everybody was not evil and wicked in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is a most uplifting book, a book that looks to the future, a book of promise, a book of loyalty and of love one for the other. That took place in the period of the judges. You wouldn't think it would have, considering the judges, but it does. And Lord willing, we'll look at that next week. We're not going to get into it tonight, even though we've got a few more minutes. We'll conclude our study on the book of Judges with this. Any further comment or question from anybody? about anything that some of your neighbors could answer? After this happened to Benjamin, it's interesting to me that Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, the first king. Paul, in the New Testament, identifies himself of the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah. And when the tribes divided north and south, Benjamin went with Judah. Went with Judah. The one that had rose up ahead of them to attack them, but Benjamin went with Judah. And even though there were some prominent men, the tribe itself never seemed to prosper, even though there were a few prominent men through history that came out of Benjamin. 
Well, it was small, numerically, smaller than the others. They didn't have as much territory as some of the others. They didn't need it. And it would have been a tragedy if they had wiped that tribe out, would it not? The first king and then the apostle Paul all came from that tribe that came within a hair's breadth of being wiped out, if not in warfare, by depriving them of women folk. But it survived. There's no way on earth that any Jewish person today can know from which tribe he has come. The Jews placed a great deal of emphasis upon genealogy records. But with the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and by the Romans, by the Romans in the year A.D. 70, all of those records were completely destroyed. People talk about Judaism. That was the religion of the Jews. There's no way on earth to restore Judaism. Who's from the tribe of Levi? Far as I know, you might be. They have no way of knowing. That nation is not God's promised nation anymore. Spiritual Israel, the church, that's God's people. But fleshly Israel served a purpose, fulfilled that purpose, and then was taken away. Well, that'll do it for tonight.